Welcome to Compromising Positions. I'm Leanne Potter, Cyber Anthropologist and Head of Security Operations for a major retailer. And I'm Jeff Watkins, a cybersecurity enthusiast and CTO for a major tech consultancy. Together, we're the tech podcast that asks non cybersecurity professionals what we in the industry could do to make their lives easier and help make our organizations more prepared to face ever changing human centric cyber threats. In this episode, we're once again joined by Damiano Bal, Head of Design at RDOC, lecturer and international speaker on all things design and data, for part two of our illuminating chat. In this episode and the BAFTA for best cybersecurity awareness training goes to we're going to look at how we practically apply design principles to our security awareness programs with things like design thinking the double diamond design method and opportunity solution trees with much much more we also discuss the dangers of gamification and how to get your BAFTA award-winning moment when delivering your security message to the business we love this chat and we think you will do too so sit back and enjoy our second interview with Damian Obal My first job in tech was um, software development. I am so grateful to the opportunity to sit in on user research sessions. At the time, it was the kind of two-way mirror. So here's our product. You give the customer an iPad, for example, and said, right, okay, navigate to these pages. And listening to how people actually use things and experience things is such an eye-opener, especially when you've written that line of code yourself or, in your case, designed it yourself. Understanding, actually, in your head, this is the journey you took because you, you designed it. But then someone picks up and does a totally, completely different thing, and that is so interesting. And there's a lot to be said about doing that analysis and understanding of challenging uh, your own expectations of how someone's going to react in a certain situation. And I think for cybersecurity professionals, we do make a lot of assumptions of how people should act, how people will act. And if we look at the statistics of cybersecurity breaches and and how they happen, we're not very good at understanding and analyzing that. But that's because uh, we, you work with humans, right? And it's kind of like the people process technology and like uh, people is the hardest to, to understand. Yeah, I think it's an interesting, so somebody, I think it might have been Beck, one of our recordings the other week, said something very, I think it was a very profound line, because I think cybersecurity awareness is higher than ever, but awareness does not equal behavioral change. And it's like, oh yeah, that, that's that's a point. There's plenty of things I can be aware of. We talked about those, they're in the UK. It was, it was some anti-copyright adverts about copying films. And it's like, you wouldn't steal a hat, you wouldn't steal a car, you wouldn't steal a, so it's just, and, and people sort of laugh at them nowadays. And I don't think it changed anything. I mean, it brought further awareness that, you know, copying a video is illegal. I'm not sure it changed many people's behavior. And that, that, I found that a really interesting like line. It's like awareness does not equal behavioral change. Like, yeah, yeah, you're right there. It's still basic. It's basic needs and like what's the shortcuts. And uh, this is the outcome I want. I was the shortest way to get there. And then it's convenience. And I think convenience, you know, you know best, but convenience, it's probably the best, uh, the, the, the biggest enemy of security or like the biggest danger, because if something is convenient, uh, we'll run with it. And a lot of times in projects, when we are uh, in a rush, then it's like, okay, like, screw this, like, screw that. And then, and product development is very hard. It's very untempting to go back and fix things. And that's where I have no visibility into that, but I'm sure that's where a lot of loopholes are created. 10 years later, you learn someone was sitting there for 10 years in your loophole that you had because you rushed with MVP. And that's where I'm saying, I don't know how, but if it's kind of, if it's not an afterthought and if it's easy. One of the other things, I guess, a modern security has quite a lot of data. You know, they, they get a lot of logging, a lot of analytics. They get a lot of, sometimes I've seen terabytes of data. You know, they, get, they get a lot. And of course, now, of course, you being both an expert in the user side and the data side, and, and obviously your, your actual talk entirely linchpins upon this, like how could, how could security teams use the data they have to tell better stories? I think just like showing it, like we, we said before, like showing it in a in a way that people can understand, saying like, hey, this is the, you mentioned like the, the quantity of data, and then this exposing it like, hey, this is how much data do we, like, uh, that's our throughput, that's a risk on its own. And then say, like, what are we doing about it? And then saying, out of all this, this is, and then you, for example, say something, out of all this, this is like, how much we actually share on email, which by default, we know email, no bueno. So, and this is how many attachments you send. And then, you know, kind of, and it's not you, Jeff, or you, Leanne, it's kind of, but you as employees, and it's kind of like more like exposing the data behind. A lot of times, that's why we love dashboards. We look at the numbers and we don't understand them. It's like, whoa, this looks, uh, yeah, this looks important. And again, it's manipulating what we show. Uh, but if you want to raise the awareness, kind of like we kind of extrapolate and um, I think it would be great to just the quantities 
and that's what I when I was working with data, that's why I learned like quantity is like I said by by default is a, is a is a risk factor because there's so much and it's like so so easy to hide a needle in a in a in a haystack. So and or like so hard to find the needle if you want. Mm, so just just expose it. I think is the first. Yeah, that's really useful. One thing I remember doing, it's mostly just because I read a book about infographics and I really wanted to try it out, but <laughs> and um, I took some of the stats from how many emails did we you know, send as an organization? How many emails did we receive? How many of those emails were malicious? How many of those emails did people click on? How many emails did those open? How much did we defend against? How much did we not defend against? And that information, you know, it was only just me really just trying out types of information to see what worked but so many people reply going that is actually really interesting i had no idea it was those volumes and i think as an industry we we don't really emphasize volumes organization i think you know if, if we, we talk in very broad senses of you know cyber crime is on the increase uh, massively it's, it's trillions of dollars um mm. something like 10.5 trillion or something like that jeff for 2025 is going to be lost to cyber criminals so absolutely a huge amount so we can we can understand that kind of thing, but when you focus it right right down to the organizational level and say, and we are a, a target, I think that that data story can be very interesting. And to your point, I think that that, that data story is already very powerful in the cybersecurity products. But the, the challenge is because that's like three people in a, in a company that actually look at those products. Uh, I've seen a couple, and they're actually very good. You know, they show you like. Hey, that person is uh, surprising a lot on Dropbox or like that person. And, you know, they can predict. I heard stories, you know, they can predict behavior when someone's going to quit. And it's, it's scary what those uh, softwares can do. It's a, so they are already powerful. They are like valuable. But then the whole security story is not distributed. It's kind of like, I think it's in the like three people have like the, a hold of it. And then there's nothing. And then there's the funny videos. So yeah. But again, there's like a, so much we can do and kind of to kind of how can we inform and share some some bits of it without exposing like, hey, we are we know much more about you than you think, for example. I think the products are there, but if we treat security more as a product, that's that's a bit more philosophical. But when we treat things like products, then we kind of we can apply, for example, principles and we say, hey, did we think about that? Did we think about is it approachable? Is it useful? Is it learnable? Was the cybersecurity product as a service is there? I think. Oh, I like that cybersecurity product as a service. Very nice. One thing we were discussing when we had a catch up before we recorded the show was your experience with design thinking and how it could be applied to cybersecurity. Could you explain for our listeners what design thinking is? Design thinking is, is one of the design methodologies or like a framework. You can call it like a school of thought almost because it's, 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 it's well known. Most designers are kind of like snarky about it because it's, it's more used by the business, so, which is great for us. If something is on a Harvard Business Review front cover, that's great. And design thinking is applying design methods to, to, for example, solving business challenges or discovering opportunities and uh, needs. And that's why it's very great because everyone can use it. It's a set of methods, set of principles that you can apply. Why it's good? Uh, it's because we can challenge things like uh, security. And we can look at it from a user perspective. We break it down. And then we, for example, focus on the, on the challenges first. We identify usually the key challenge. And we say, like, okay, this is the three areas that we think are the most important. And then again, you apply different design methods, of ideation, come up with solutions, potential solutions. And then you kind of zoom zoom in again and say, like, hey, this is the one we're going to develop uh, and we're going to test it. So if, I'm sure most of your, your listeners are familiar with like the, the typical like the, the design uh, double diamond. It's like very mm -hmm. famous, like the double diamond. Mm -hmm. So first you go abroad to identify all the all the different uh, challenges. Then you then you convert on one challenge that you want to tackle and again, open up to, to find as many solutions as possible. And this the double diamond to me describes very nicely the, the gist of design thinking and uh, different design methods applied, not necessarily only to designers and with security. I think we could do a lot. <laughs> For a part of a talk we were building before, we were looking at some of the the, the uh, elements of design thinking into 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 threat modeling and things like that. Into when it comes to actually thinking about the other side, like how might we attack? Yes, exactly. And there's all this like product thinking. Uh, for example, it's uh, quite used now with Teresa Torres with like the um, uh, 
opportunity solution trees. And then you go the whole way from the challenge, which is automatically also an opportunity. If something is a problem, it's also a product opportunity. And then you go down and say like, okay, what are the potential solutions for it? And then you say, we're going to pick one and we're going to do three experiments. And then uh, you test those hypothesis and then say we are wrong so we go back so it's kind of it's almost like a tax trees but it's i was about to say that yes. it feels like we came full circle with that and that, that exactly. made me smile that made me smile a lot and i guess <laughs> then the same could be true is if you build those attack trees and you go let's try some of these and see and see what were countermeasures we put in place to make that not a thing anymore yeah, yeah that's very interesting uh thank and you that's why that. it's uh it's it's interesting uh it's because it's you can connect the dots and that's important. And in tech tree, you kind of connect the dots. You go from, from A to Z and in everything we do with design thinking, for example, is connecting the dots. So it feels, it feels whole, it feels end to end. And that's mm. by default, it's much easier if we, if we go back to the story, then you can tell it. You can say, this is what we did. You know, we're kind of exposing ourselves and that's what design is usually relatively okay. Or at least we try to do that to kind of show what we're working on. Uh, mm. so it's kind of there's no secret we were forced to do that in the past because you know it was hard to invest in design so uh, it was very untangible especially research so we need to that's what we're doing you know that's that's our deliverables but with cybersecurity, it's like okay what what actually it, it's kind of it's out there it's very untangible and i think despite it being untangible we need to as an industry cybersecurity professionals give ourselves permission to experiment and i think that's probably the actual big barrier is jumping over because we and rightly so yes the stakes are very high if we get this wrong however if we think about it before it happens and try and manage it in the abstract first and, and run in an experimental way these four exercises surely that's much better than over complicating a process over complicating um policies that might yes in the first instance stop anything from happening but maybe literally stop anything from happening as in stopping other people being productive in what they need to do and i wonder how do you change that mindset of i'm too scared to experiment with these four ex experiments because the stakes are so high i think it's because they are so high we we need to experiment <laughs> but not to sound philosophical but because it's so important for example what design usually does is like we tackle the hard questions like the easy questions are Usually you don't apply design thinking and the whole, we just fix them. So when we do spend time, it's when something is hard. When we think about like horizon projects, for example, that's where you do proper research. And that's when, when things are really important, when the stakes are high, when uh, I keep repeating myself saying, like, explaining what uh, my, my role is, for example, as, uh, as a head of design is like to minimize risk of investment. That's what we do. So kind of to speed up the process and minimize the risk. So we kind of try to be more certain that what we're building is the right thing. So that's why I think experimenting is good. But in your world, you look really cool doing it. When you say it like that, <laughs> I'm like, that's something I should be saying, but you look cool when you say it. And I, I look like the bad guy. So <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. That's a good point because then you look like, oh, you, you don't know what you're doing. So it's, yeah, you cannot admit it's a good point. But then you need to get allies. I think that's, the, and then ex distribute uh, the experimentation process. I think that's, that's what, for example, designers are very good at getting like other people like, excited. So, because we usually we are understaffed and then we kind of need allies. So we kind of, so we usually the first ones to go would be developers and then we kind of convert them to decent, semi-decent designers. So they are the advocates. So it's kind of, if you can do that, and then we do that by those, like, uh, for example, we're design thinking, so we do lightweight. So they feel like I can do that. Like, uh, I, I think this is this whole uh, user thing is uh, is exciting. So then it kind of, and I say, okay, my work here is done. It feels very similar to people trying to engage like developers in security champion programs, only maybe you're doing it in a slightly more design thinking way and then like in thinking about the actual engagement more than the actual, the impact, let's say the impact skills rather than soft skills, rather than the um, hard skills and technical skills. One thing we um, mentioned earlier and, and in another chat, we talked about gamifying cybersecurity. You mentioned before some of the downsides potentially to gamification. Yeah, my, my answer would be just, oh, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> and that's coming from a designer. I really hate when we, like I said before, I love I love games. I'm like a gamer of my heart. So I have my, I, I love my, my son turn, he's turning nine. So I'm like super excited I can game with him. I love games, but not everything should be gamified. And that was, uh, I sadly grew up in times when everything was gamified for the worst. And like I said, security doesn't have to be fun. If we gamify parts of it, I think that's great. 
if we gamify, for example, if you're a developer, like who's gonna find the most bugs, like who's gonna hack our system first. And I know there's some, some, uh, security, uh, software that does that, for example, that's great. But if we try to gamify for, for example, for me as a designer, that's like, tell me what I need to know. And like, I don't have to be part of this game. I'm mature enough to understand it's important if you tell me like in a nice, short, human way. So not disagreeing. I love that we are trying to, but I think cybersecurity is the most gamified, definitely in all the onboardings. It's the most gamified I've ever seen. And that's like, I've seen uh, so many different programs and softwares and uh, videos and they're all gamified. And the doc is like, we're going to solve it. But it's the same as with engagement at work, for example, all these like engagement surveys. And I feel we're kind of um, in this loop that everybody's copying each other and no one's finding a better solution to the problem. And then we're just trying to, to slap gamification on it. But, uh, you know, sometimes when you go running, Strava is not gamified, you know, or like any run keeper or whatever we use. It's not gamified. It's like leaderboard. That's not gamified. I'm I'm just incentivized to it. Others try to gamify it and then they said, you know, it's like kind of childish. Like, why don't we just give them leaderboards and then they compete with themselves? So long story, but I don't think gamification is the solution or the answer. It's, it's great if we do it, but it's not the answer. Yeah, I hate it. Mm. Sorry. <laughs> I remember you mentioned this before. I really wanted to get your opinions on it. So I think it's the first thing when people are struggling with engagement, it's the first thing that people reach for nowadays without necessarily understanding what it actually means in the first place, which I think is another problem. Yep. Yeah, and it's not solving the problem. It's, for example, when uh, there was uh, the pandemic, the COVID, and then all the companies they invested in this like uh, remote well-being and it's great but it's not a solution to the problem it's just like talk to be nice like talk to people ask them how they're doing it's don't give them free software it's not going to be a solution and uh, just because it looks nice and it, i love it I, like i'm a designer so i love all those like programs but it will never replace someone asking like hey damian how are you doing or in in the case of cybersecurity, if someone's saying like hey this is what we achieved with your help or like this is what we could do because uh, you are helping us kind of be more uh, security aware. I think nothing replaces that. Just tell them what it is <laughs> and why I should care. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to give a shout out to a book which does touch upon what you were saying, which was, you know, applied badly. It's just bad gamification. And there's a book called Actionable Gamification by, and I'm going to ruin this, Yu Kai Chow. And I'm going to put it in the show notes. And literally that book opens with, so this chap has dedicated his whole career to gamification, but it opens with, Actually, most cases, it doesn't work. <laughs> and and it, it's, it's, a, it's a big old tomb of a book, but uh, it's really interesting. And then you need, he goes through the, the idea of, as you touched upon there, like at one point, everything was gamified, you know, especially apps and things like that, you know. But the whole purpose of that was to keep you engaged in a almost negative sense. There's, there's definitely, you can be engaged in a process, but it doesn't feed your soul, as it were. It doesn't influence behavior. It's, it's just that dopamine hit which is doesn't change anything yeah, exactly and that's that's where like good gamification if we go to any good game what they're good at is like like it's very easy to get on board so it's like and then it's like uh what's like grogging uh, i think is could be the term it's kind of it's just hard enough or just easy enough so it's kind of it's always a challenge and that's very hard to do that's why we have game designers and game studios that actually spend time on that and you cannot just say i'm going to do the same in our software so it's kind of mm. not as easy so uh, it's a whole process behind it. No, no, and there definitely needs to be caution if that's the way you're going to go. Not saying I've not seen it done well, but I've also seen more occasions where it's not done well. So I mean, you're, you're very right to be suspicious of it, and I'm very glad that we got your thoughts <laughs> on it, considering your background as well. <laughs> If you find something that really works, please let me know. I'm like, I'm really, <laughs> I'm really a fan of gamification if it's done right. Mm. Like zombies run, for example, is amazing. Like when you run and then zombies chasing you, that's amazing. But it's one of the really, the only good example of sports gamified apps. But, but because that's they have the, like a BAFTA um, writer. <laughs> that's that's the app on um, when you're doing running, isn't it? Where where you, yeah. you have to pretend. Yeah. It's from it's from I think it's from uh, from Scotland. But mm. there's like two writers actually behind it. Like one is like a BAFTA winner, something, mm. something. So it's like actual people who know how to write for it. I mean, just finding decent cybersecurity professionals in general is hard, but getting a BAFTA nominated cybersecurity <laughs> professional, that's going to be really, really tough. If anyone working in that industry wants to come and join the cybersecurity industry, we'll welcome you with open arms. Come and design all our security awareness training. 
but to, but to your point and sorry for jumping in like in design for example we value writing and i'm very fortunate like i joined a team and we have like two writers on, on 10 designers and that's like like it's very important so you need to tell story through your ui for example through the interface through the journey so it's very very important to have this story aspect and how it sounds how it feels we call it content not just writing but uh but it is a good point so Awesome. Well, you have been absolutely generous with your time. I've really enjoyed this conversation. If our listeners want to reach out to you, where can they find you? And don't forget to plug. Don't forget to plug your courses as well. <laughs> uh, no, no, I, I'm. Uh, I live online, so feel free to share uh, my my contacts, like my email and uh, all the social media, LinkedIn, uh, so we can we can share with the listeners. I'm very happy to respond, especially on the topics that, that I'm not that familiar with. I started working with data because I had no idea with it. I worked with embedded systems because it felt cool and uh, alien. I now work with enterprise architecture. Like, how cool is that, right? So again, I love being surrounded by people smarter than myself. And that's why I'm very happy and uh, honored to be invited uh, uh, to the podcast. Thank you. Oh, you're too kind. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, we'll put everything in the show notes so people can contact you. Definitely want to follow absolutely love all the content you put out it's always so interesting and thought-provoking and if you can catch him speaking i know that you do a lot of public speaking internationally make the effort i really would recommend it mm -hmm. thank you so Definitely. much for your time thank you thank Bye -bye. you Bodley and Jeff. Mm, the eternal battle between convenience and security means we've got quite the task on our hands yeah humans are always looking for that shortcut do you normally say that humans are inherently lazy? I do. And with good reason, as our evolution has relied on it. It relies on us to be lazy, look for shortcuts, make decisions based on heuristics. It's all part of our evolution. That we don't expend unnecessary energy on things when things hit the proverbial fan. Yeah, but why isn't security enough of a threatening prospect to stop people from acting insecurely? Well, Damian touched on it a few times in our interview with him. It's down to the intangibility of the threat. Most people are aware of what needs to be done to have good security hygiene, but it really is a numbers game. So unless you've been actually hit by a security incident or have seen a security control do its job, we kind of compartmentalize the threat as non-urgent and all those extra controls are just an inconvenience to the activities that do feel rewarding. And I think that's where it becomes important to apply the design thinking methods that Damian was talking about. It reminds me of product development where we're aiming for a happy user experience that is low friction and error free. That should be the goal in security too. Oh, I agree. And that's why Damian Damian's security product as a service really got me excited. Can you imagine how much easier it would be to get buy-in from the business if we badged up security in this way? Yeah, I think it would help a lot because they're already used to thinking in product-centric terms. Why not do the same for security? Absolutely. What a fantastic episode. Mm, yeah. So links to everything that Damian discussed in this episode can be found in the show notes. And if you like the show, please do leave us a review and share on LinkedIn or in your teams. It really helps us spread the word and get high-quality guests like Damian on future episodes. We hope you enjoyed this episode. See you next time. Keep Secure, and don't forget to ask yourself, am I the compromising position here?